Welcome back. So last time we were talking about things to avoid. It was uh, quite a list of dangers and fallacies. Uh, like fallacy of composition and vision, red herrings, uh, inappropriate appeals to authority, and uh, appeals to ignorance. When is evidence of absence of evidence evidence of absence, and when is it not? Basically, stuff to watch out for. That exists within the realm of rhetoric. How to actually navigate a conversation or an issue higher level, more general stuff than than syllogisms or the logical building blocks that we've been paying attention to so far. So we'll, right now we'll keep going with more things to watch out for. Well, why is this a separate video? It should have been in the things to watch out for video. Because... This is separate because once we get to a certain, a few things to watch out for, if we play those in reverse, they can be good things. Sounds weird, but let's start by finishing with things to watch out for. Okay. Um... One, th another bad habit, or usually bad habit, that people tend to apply when they're in a conflict or an argument is the rhetoric of the slippery slope. Sometimes it's a fallacy, sometimes it's not. It's a re rhetorical habit or tool okay we know what it's for now what is it so it's really an reductio ad absurdum uh, demonstration where okay uh, just in case we haven't gone over what a reductio is we talk about it a lot in the book but I don't remember speaking about it it's a negative proof by taking something to an extreme. So someone says there's some, some relationship, things work some way, and you think they're wrong. And you try to prove it by saying, okay, we'll do this, and then that's the next step, then that's the next step, then that's the next step, and we keep going, and eventually we get to some crazy or obviously horrible outcome. If it gets us to a wrong answer or something we don't want, then the process that led us there, or the facts that we started from, at least one of those can't be right. A reductio is where you show a crazy conclusion, or obviously crazy. Everyone agrees it's crazy. And then you, after you've shown the crazy conclusion, you infer that there must be something wrong in the argument. Because uh, arguments that are based on true facts and proceed with valid syllogisms shouldn't lead to crazy outcomes. So the fact that we have a crazy outcome shows that the argument's bad. Either the facts are untrue or the syllogisms are invalid. The slippery slope fallacy is when you sort of straw man. It's a straw man reductio. Let's actually let's write that. It's a straw man. A reductio of a straw man. It's where you 
say, okay, if we do one thing, then another thing is going to happen, then yet another and another, and eventually some one of those eventually is going to be bad. And since the last one's bad, we shouldn't even start on the first one. Like, someone might say, like, this is a big debate in America about 10 years ago with a Obamacare. Someone might argue that the adoption of a single-payer national health care system will lead to the adoption of all kinds of socialist measures. And the implication that a tidal wave of socialism would probably be bad. So let's not do the national health care system. Would be the logic of that slippery slope. Once we start sliding down the mildly socialistic step of a national health care system, we won't be able to stop that trend. Is the implication. When you think someone that's is making a probably incorrect over extrapolation, the easiest way to expose a fallacious slippery slope is to just ask more questions about it. Oh, oh wow, uh, what, what other social, socialistic measures specifically? And would a tidal wave of socialism be good or bad? I don't know, if, if you're a socialist, you might consider that to be a good thing. And how exactly will this transition take place? A slippery slope, or, or even a reductio ad absurdum, has a lot of steps. Tell me more about all those steps. I've never thought about it that way. And why will the trend be inexorable? Why will it always invariably go that one way and not go back? Tell me more. Because you, obviously you're an expert in this. Inform me. And then one of two things will happen when you ask those more detailed questions. Either you'll get a great detailed explanation and you'll learn something. Or the person won't be able to give a great detailed explanation and their initial slippery slope, this will happen, this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen, claim will look hysterical or stupid, or it might be true, but this person doesn't really know what they're talking about. Either they'll give a great explanation and you'll learn something, or their inability to fill in the details of their long chain of steps will make them look stupid and you've sort of won the debate uh, just by letting them make themselves look stupid. So that's how you deal with slippery slopes. We... Initially, intro we in initially introduced slippery slopes as a fallacy. They're in the fallacy section, but they're not always fallacies. It's clo they're closely related to a reductio ad absurdum negative proof, which is a perfectly legitimate logical and rhetorical tool, so commonly used that it gets a Latin name. So commonly used that in English we usually shorten that Latin name to just a reductio. We know it were, it's an ad absurdum reductio. So that's a pretty normal, kosher, accepted, logical and rhetorical tool. Maybe slippery slopes are sort of okay too. Sometimes slopes genuinely are slippery. Just because people often uh, overly generalize how slippery a slope is doesn't mean that truly slippery slopes don't exist. They do exist when a positive feedback relationship is involved. Uh, here's an example of a 
slope that might indeed have been slippery. So, uh, okay, I guess the current coronavirus is sort of actually a big deal. But in 2008, the U.S. financial government had a very similar reaction of printing a real lot of new currency. Counterfeit money? Or... Well, they printed a real lot of new currency, which is generally, well, it's becoming really common, but at least traditionally it was seen as a drastic emergency measure. So why did they take this giant emergency step? Well, the uh, prices of houses were going down a little bit, and they don't usually go down. Usually they go up and they're going down. That's not good. So house prices were going down a little bit, and you pulled out these giant emergency measures? Connect the two dots for me. It would seem like the government intensely overreacted to what sounds like not such a big deal. Houses are things. Things have prices. Prices go up, sometimes down, sometimes. It's sort of normal. What were they thinking? Well, they thought they, that there was a genuinely slippery slope. Uh, a lot of Americans considered their homes mark-to-market dollar price to be a l giant indicator of how rich or poor they are. So if home prices go down a little bit, even if they weren't, actually looking to sell their house, they get scared that their financial situation isn't as good as it was, and then they stop, if they're scared about their financial situation, they stop buying stuff. If they stop buying so much stuff, the companies that sell that stuff, they're in a bad si financial situation, which means that they uh, uh, lay off employees, get rid of some workers. When those workers are gotten rid of, they don't have a job, they don't have money, they can't buy stuff, and then other businesses for whom they were the customers, they're not customers anymore. So then more businesses have no business and lay off people, and you get this giant cascade of uh, bad economic news out of this one little piece of bad economic news. Like, dominoes. One hits one, the next one goes over, and soon, even though your poke that hit the first domino was tiny, you can get this giant cascade of dominoes falling over all over. A chain reaction or a positive feedback is what that was. Whether that was only true in economists' imagination or whether that was actually going to happen in real life, it's debatable, and honestly, this isn't an economics course. Maybe we can do an economics course some other time, but that would be a later semester. For now, suffice it to say that they thought there was a impending chain reaction or positive feedback loop. And so they took actions based on a slippery slope story. And unless they were factually wrong about something, their actions basically made sense. Drastic as they were. In that situation, the slippery slope was not a fallacy. Okay, well, sure, cool. Slippery slope's a thing. Sometimes it's misapplied, sometimes it's correctly applied. Why bother spending all this time talking about it? There's lots of heuristics, fallacies, little rhetorical cognitive phenomena that we could talk about. Why, why, why did Justin pick this one? I hope to... I put at the end of the fallacy chapter 
things that might not always be fallacies or bad habits, but possibly the foundation of tact and diplomacy and wittiness. The simplest version of an example there is slippery slopes. Generally, you slide down a slope. Now let's have a slippery hill, a sticky hill. A slippery slope, but where you're going up instead of going down. Going up to smiley faces. So, let's go back to the first example of a slippery slope situation. That example was, if we go to a single-payer healthcare system, that will open the floodgates of socialism. Okay, that's a slippery slope. Another slippery slope. Keep on practicing, and you'll soon be an expert. Keep doing A, and eventually B will happen. Let's, let's write that. They were, both of those sentences were of the f abstract form, keep doing A and eventually B will happen. The first one, it sounded like a warning or a, uh, or it sounded like the speaker wasn't happy about it. Keep doing this bad habit and a disaster will eventually happen. That's how slippery slopes are usually phrased. But keep on practicing and you'll still be an expert. Keep on doing A, practice. And eventually, competence will happen. Keep doing the mundane thing. And eventually, a big good thing will happen. Big bad thing happens. Big good thing happens. So depending on the content of the slippery slope statement, it could be fear-mongering, or it could be encouraging and uh, stimulating perseverance. Now, stimulating perseverance and encouraging someone is generally a good thing. Not always, but usually it's good. And that sounds very different than what we've been talking about so far in this section. Usually it's trickery and bad things. But here, with the slippery slope, sticky hill, we had the same logical form, keep doing A and eventually B will happen. And we made up an example where it's basically an encouraging compliment. The point is that, the, that's illustrated by that, is that rhetoric is just a tool. Tools can be used for lots of things, like a knife. It can be used for everything from killing to cooking. There's not really moral value on the knife itself. Are you a tool of uh, mass murder or a tool of making cake? It, it's just a tool. It, it's not going to, it, it doesn't, it can be either. It could be both. Rhetoric is the same way. Depends how you use it. It can be used, it's usually talked about in the context of being used towards mean, negative, devious ends. But that's sort of a biased perspective. It's also possible to use it in more positive, eusocial ways. And that shouldn't be forgotten. If we're trying to learn how to be more tactful, diplomatic, witty people, 
we need to study rhetoric. Just like the politician or the salesman might study rhetoric for purposes of deceiving people, even nice people would still want to study it so they can do a better job of being nice. Talking about rhetoric it is usually done in the context of self def like verbal or self defense. Watch out for when people do these bad things. Make sure they don't trick you. And yeah, that's one use case. It's valid. I'll, I'll go with it. But it's I feel that people are missing something when they have that be the only use case for rhetoric. If you're trying to be complimentary or comedic or even diplomatic, the tools of the deceiver are tools you need in your good person toolbox. We saw both a fear-mongering don't do this, or a disaster will happen, a scoldy, thready thing. And we also saw a compliment encouraging perseverance. In, and both of them were in the form of slippery slopes. Beyond slippery slopes, there's two more double-edged scalpels. I'm not going to call them swords. Swords are big and for hacking. The, the, this is more like a scalpel for more detailed work. The two other double-edged scalpels are innuendo and loaded questions. Okay, so what are those? More words that, that we don't know yet. Innuendo is where you explicitly deny the thing that you're implying. Well, that sounds weird. Can you give me an example? Uh, sure. Um, an example of innuendo. I'm not saying that you're drunk, but I, I just noticed that you did replace all the bottles in your liquor cabinet. I'm not saying that you're ex, but I did notice this thing that would lead a normal person to conclude that you're an ex. Although not me, I, I didn't say it. In fact, I said... I'm not saying it, but I did bring it up, throw the idea out there, and produce some evidence that one might use as premises to reach that conclusion. Oh, I'm not going towards that conclusion, but I made it very easy for anyone else who's listening to go to that conclusion. Usually innuendo conclusions are... Uh, accusatory, negative things, and you avoid stating it directly, you're a drunk, because the, the person might react negatively to such an accusation or an implication that they're bad in some way. But the more indirect you make it, the less likely they are to get all upset. Okay, so that's innuendo. Now, before we get into how innuendo can be used in a nice way, or, or can be just be useful, we'll also define a loaded question. Uh, a loaded question is usually a yes or no question, a binary answer, options, but where neither a yes or a no makes you look good. You're, whichever way you answer it, the same conclusion about you in general is reached by slightly different paths, but... Um, Basically, you get to the same path by the by different methods. So the generally the right way to answer a loaded question is to refuse the yes or no either or choice. Clearly state that it's a false dilemma and that you noticed that the question was loaded 
and noticed it even before you replied with a yes or no. Catching loaded questions takes some speed and mental agility and real thinking. It doesn't always happen. But okay, and a question where whether you answer yes or no, the same outcome happens. That sounds pretty abstract again. So let's uh, go with a um, example. So have you stopped beating your wife? Generally, spousal abuse is a very bad thing. And so someone wouldn't want to incriminate themselves sort of admitting to be a spousal abuser, a wife beater. Well, so uh, the question was asked, so have you stopped beating your wife? And it sounds like you, the questioner wants a yes or a no answer. If we answer, uh, no. Oh, so you still beat her? You have not stopped doing the bad thing? Uh, okay, so no is apparently the wrong answer. Let's try it. Yes. Yes, I've, I've stopped. Well, if you have stopped, then you're implicitly admitting that you used to do the bad thing. That you used to hit your wife. Well, uh, Chances are the person doesn't want to admit to having done the bad thing in the past, either. So, no implies that you still do the bad thing. Yes implies that maybe you stopped, but you're still a pretty bad person who used to do the bad thing. Either way, yes or no, the general conclusion would be reached that you're a horrible person. The, the real, the good way to answer that loaded question would be not yes or not no, but well, actually, I have never beaten my wife. And you, you can't stop doing something that you've never started. And it, the correct, the useful answer would be a nonlinear, not, it would be, the useful answer is a rejection of the false dilemma. The, yeah, that, I should actually put that in. The, a good response to a loaded question rejects the false dilemma that the question implies. Of course, um, doing that in real time before you blurt out a yes or a no is not always easy. And so people tend to get trapped in loaded questions and innuendos a lot. You do need to be aware of these things, at least from a self-defense perspective. If you... If you don't have the critical thinking muscles and epistemic outlook to catch loaded questions and you always answer loaded questions with like some yes or some no you'll you'll be a hilarious blunderer and it'll be so much fun to make you make a fool of yourself answering loaded questions and so it would be very difficult for not so kind people to resist 
getting you to put your, getting you to make uh, blundery statements. So if you don't want to find yourself ha made, having made a new best bully, it would be good for you to avoid making a fool of yourself when you are presented with a loaded question. So from a self-defense perspective, you do need to be aware of slippery slopes, innuendos, and loaded questions. Even if you don't intend on making innuendos and loaded questions yourself. Or should you? Ooh, and you thought I was on a complete tangent when I had that early uh, bit in the preface about the two my two-dimensional theory of good and evil. Maybe you should use innuendos and loaded questions. Even if we're sticking to the benevolent side and not the nefarious side, a benevolent but competent person, I contend, might use lots of loaded questions and innuendos, as would a nefarious and competent person. Innuendos are sort of hard to construct. You're an ex, you're you're a you're a whatever bad thing is a lot easier to think and say than I'm not saying you're an ex, I'm not saying you're that bad person, but oh well, well, I did notice this piece of evidence that would lead a dispassionate observer to reach the conclusion that you're an ex. That second method of implying something takes a lot more mental gymnastics than the direct, you're an ex. And so, incompetent people, whether benevolent or nefarious, unskilled people probably can't manage to create good innuendos, at least not quickly, on the fly, in real conversation. Same with loaded questions. A question that gets you to the same big conclusion, no matter which yes or no way you answer it, that sort of takes some thinking if you're going to construct one of those. Incompetent, dumb people just can't do it. So, these things, loaded questions and innuendos, exist entirely in the, comp in the competent half of the graph. Whether they're all on the nefarious side or, or some on the benevolent side is logically subsequent. We can talk about that later. We will. But first, I'd like, after the fire truck goes by, I'd like to point out the underlying fact that these rhetorical devices, innuendos and loaded questions, are only available to the people on the competent side. The less competent people probably only say things directly. It's way simpler. Not always so nice, though. So, we'll start with a, with a use case for innuendo for a good, for a non-nefarious person. So, um, let's continue with the drinking example, because that, that was our first example for innuendo. Uh, let's continue with the exact same example. I'm not saying you're a drunk, but I did notice that you replaced uh, the bottles in your liquor cabinet. Why would that be better than saying, wow, you drink a lot? The direct implication. 
in UN the in, the advantage of innuendo is that it gives you more options for how to move next for your next chess move in the conversation and it doesn't put so much pressure on the other person maybe the other person has a drinking problem and doesn't like to talk about it, then they're probably going to get mad at you or at least get very upset that you brought that topic up. Unless you actually feel it's worthwhile to confront the person on it or intentionally want to make them upset, you probably don't want them getting upset. So the direct one would be bad. Or maybe they have a perfectly good reason for replacing all the bottles. Maybe they had a party. If you directly say, you're a drunk, if they're not a drunk, then it, or even if they are, it's become the, you put the onus on them to refute your statement that they're a drunk. No, I had a party. You make it necessary for them to produce a fact or two to refute your aggressive labeling statement. And maybe they don't want to tell you that they had a party. Maybe they had a party and didn't invite you. And they're like, oh, I don't want to tell them that I... Maybe they don't want to tell you that they had a party. Maybe they'll think that you don't like them and that you should have been invited, but maybe they don't like you. And so maybe the guy will be, maybe the other person will be like, yes, I am a drunk. And just lie about that just so they don't have to tell you that he didn't invite you to the party. And then we have a web of lies. And webs of lies get difficult to manage very quickly, so generally we want to avoid constructing them when we don't have to. Whereas if you. So the direct route, the direct statement route, puts some pressure on the person who's hearing it. They've got to uh, refute your statement or explain about the party that they maybe didn't want to tell you about. They've, they've got to do something. And doing something's hard. We're lazy. I don't like to do something. I, I prefer a lot of nothing. The innuendo method gives the the listener more options and gives everyone more options. Let's say you said it the innuendo way and the person reacts defensively. They they might they look like they're getting upset. And so you wish, "Oh, I wish I hadn't said that." I wish I hadn't said, you're a drunk, or whatever. With the direct statement, you're a drunk, to, to take that back, you need a time machine. If you say it the innuendo way, though, you don't need a time machine. You have plausible deniability. If they, if they react as if you're making an accusation and you don't want to have that difficult conversation, you could instead say, oh, uh, Lefroy Quartercast, I love that. Maybe you could, you could spin it, oh, no, I wasn't implying that you are a drunk. I, I was commenting on this one specific bottle. You have good taste with the indirectness of innuendo, you would have the opportunity to pivot and say, oh, I was complimenting your taste on this specific thing. I didn't imply that you're drunk. I implied that you have good taste. Difficult topic avoided. The innuendo way is worth the extra complexity because it gives you more options. You can pivot in 
And if a conversation one way looks like it's going bad, you can pivot to a different direction. Options are safety. Um, innuendos allow one to be more agile and diplomatic in conversation. And maybe some of the people listening to this will end up with jobs in diplomacy. Uh, being diplomatic sometimes can be pretty necessary. Uh, they even have a profession called diplomat. And if you're an undiplomatic diplomat, that can cause some problems. So knowing how to be diplomatic is useful. And usually people just say, oh, be nice. Well, ne that's necessary, but not sufficient. Be nice allows for the benevolent but incompetent quadrant. And we don't want to be in that quadrant. Even we want to be on the competent side of the graph. Hopefully you'll be nice rather than be a supervillain, but at least be somewhere on the side of, the, of competence. So with innuendo, we saw... Ver with innuendo versus direct statements, you have two different tools. One isn't... Which, which one is better is very situation-dependent. Like, if, if you're ordering food at a restaurant, you want to be direct and unambiguous. If you're, metaphor if, if you're metaphorical and ambiguous, you might not get the right food. You, chances are the waiter will be worried they won't know if they're giving you the right food. It'll just make things harder for everyone. So there certainly are situations where direct and unambiguous is best. But there are also situations where the ambiguity of innuendo is a lot safer for everyone involved. Uh, conversation is largely an adventure in walking in the fog, trying to learn about the social, political, psychological terrain of these mysterious entities called other people. And that enterprise in entails a lot of learning about where an open-ended set of poorly marked boundaries are. And that involves a lot of trial and error. Now, you could just run headlong, tripping over boundaries and smashing into things. You could do it that way. But we might smash a few fewer things and have less injuries and less social mayhem. If instead of just sort of running headlong with unambiguous declarative statements, if we had at least the option to sort of wander with our hands out and like it's dark and we're trying to feel our way around. When you're in a dark room full of furniture, you, you generally don't run across until you smash into a table. You walk slowly with your hands out and feel your way across. It's a lot slower, and it's a lot harder, but things then tend not to go as badly. Fewer smashing disasters. Our positive use of innuendo is the conversational equivalent of wandering slowly in the fog with your hands out, not sprinting through the fog. Sometimes one's better, sometimes the other's better, but it's good to have both options in your toolbox. That is the art of rhetoric. It's hard stuff, but that's why it goes at the end. It's the icing on the cake. Okay, so we've done innuendo. What about loaded questions? Hmm... What they, and sarcasm, we'll get to sarcasm next, are is intelligence tests. 
well, somewhat... Okay, they're... The variables aren't isolated very well. They're sort of intelligence tests, paying attention tests, how well does this person know me relationship tests. If you bundle those three things into one, I know it's messy. But that's what loaded questions and sarcasm really do. They're a test, they're more or less an intelligence test for the person you're talking to. Granted, there are other kinds of intelligence tests, but most of them take a long time. Like, given someone a real IQ test, it just, it could take 20 minutes. That would be a big cost and a big delay in the conversation. Whereas with loaded questions and sarcasm, which we'll get to next, you can hide an intelligence test within a sentence. It doesn't slow things down. It's not even obvious that you're conducting an intelligence test. Are you an idiot? No, just checking, just checking. Loaded questions and sarcasm allow us to do that very subtly and efficiently. Not with a high level of precision, but any information is better than zero information. Or even a little information is better than zero. So why would we need to do intelligence tests on the person we're talking to? Well, it's good to know, well, how you navigate a conversation depends on a few things. If you're talking to a really smart person who, who understands the thing you're trying to talk about better than you do, and so you know that even if you're stumbling over your words and sort of messing it up, that they'll have reinvented your idea in their own head, better than you have it, before you even finish your sentence. And you can relax and know that they're going to understand it, even if you're doing a bad job of communicating it, just because they're that smart, they'll reinvent it as you're speaking. Talking to a really smart colleague like that, you can be more relaxed and confident that the idea will get communicated successfully than if you're talking to an idiot. And an idiot probably isn't going to reinvent the thing that you're yourself struggling with before you finish the sentence. They're, they're not going to run ahead of you like that. They can't. So you'll need to be a lot clearer and have your own ideas way better in order before trying to communicate outside your head to another person if you're dealing with an idiot. If you're dealing with a trusted person whom you consider to be a genius, they'll help you figure, figure it out even before you've finished figuring it out in your own head. Two very different situations. Also, does the person know you well? And do they care about you? Those of factors definitely affect how a conversation should proceed. And if you misappraise whether someone cares about you or not, and or misappraise whether or not the person knows you well, you can have run into some communication disasters. So these little intelligence tests are a good thing for increasing conversational safety. I sort of pulled three things out there, intelligence, uh, attention, and rapport, uh, how well the other person knows you. Those three are really jumbled together with the use of sarcasm. A loaded question really more just tests for intelligence and awakeness, paying attention. But I'd like to test for those things. I'd like to know whether the person I'm talking to is half asleep, they've 
they got no sleep last night. They're just their brain's not on. They're not in a mood for a real intelligent conversation. Or if they're just stupid and they're never in the mood for an intelligent conversation, I'd like to know that. That'll help me decide whether they're a person I want to bounce my ideas off of or a person I want to avoid in the future. And I need some data to make an informed decision about that. Loaded questions can help us get that data. They'd have The person would have to be pretty smart to notice that a question is loaded before replying yes or no to it. They'd have to be pretty awake and mentally fast to realize that the pragmatic ultimate conclusion that a question gets us to will be the same conclusion whether you answer it with a yes or a no. They've got to be pretty sharp to figure that out and to figure it out before trying to answer with a yes or no. Figuring it out before by by their imagination, not by figuring it out through trial and error. So if I ask a loaded question, depending on whether I get a yes or no, or a stop asking loaded questions, you are trying to trick me, or a non-linear answer, like, actually, I've never beaten my wife. Although, technically, I have, therefore, technically, I guess it would be a no. I have not stopped beating her, but it's because I've never beat her ever, not because I still beat her. Determining that, so how one responds to a loaded question, either with a great nonlinear response or by telling you you're a jerk for asking a loaded question versus a yes or no, those two different sets of replies will inform you about the intelligence confounded with awakeness of the person you're talking to. A loaded question can help you form an opinion of the either the general intellect or the transient state of awakeness and paying attention of your conversational partner. So I might very well start off a conversation with a loaded question. Hey, how's the project going? Have you finished reinventing the wheel yet? A little bit of an idiom, but the wheel is a very important invention that was invented a long time ago. It's important, but we already have wheels. So if you're doing the work to reinvent something we've had, we already have, you're wasting a lot of time and effort. You're trying to be smart, but in a very stupid way. So reinventing the wheel is bad. Uh, just uh, just in case you weren't familiar with that sort of idiom. So, now that we know what reinventing the wheel means, I start off my hello, my, I start the conversation by, Hey, how's the project going? Have you finished reinventing the wheel yet? It's a loaded question. If I have finished reinventing the wheel, then I reinvented the wheel. I wasted a lot of time and effort. Bad. If I haven't finished reinventing the wheel yet, no, then I am still wasting time and effort. Bad. Loaded question. Both yes and no are bad answers. Of course, someone could just say, like, screw you, or there are, or they could, they could have a non-yes or no third option answer. They could avoid the false dilemma that the question implies. So I could start the conversation that way. Hey, how's the project going? Have you finished reinventing the wheel yet? Waiting to see if I get a yes or a no, or something else. Now, why would I start the conversation off that way? Because I, I, if I probably will a lot, I do that. Why, why would that make sense? Well, if I'm saying hi, maybe I either do want to talk to you, 
probably about something deep and substantive and unsolved and I we have a, a topic to figure out or I just sort of felt obligated to acknowledge your presence but I really don't want to talk to you one of those two whether or not I want to talk to you probably depends a lot on the quality of conversation that I think I'm going to get back if you're if you got no sleep last night and you're just dead tired and you don't want to talk and you can't you can't think right now then I prob then I we probably shouldn't really talk right now or if you're just a stupid person we probably shouldn't talk ever so maybe we shouldn't talk or maybe we should talk or maybe I do want to talk with you because you're a genius and I walk away smarter with problems solved every time I see you or at least this time going into the conversation deciding whether to dive into conversation or to evade I'd like to know what state of intelligence you are in Taking the time to do an IQ test would waste both our time and probably be offensive. But the loaded question is this mini IQ test. If you answer with a yes or no, you're in stupid mode, or you're just stupid. And I end the conversation as quickly as possible. If you answer with something else, not a yes or no, even it was, though it was pretty much a yes or no loaded question, oh, you're awake, you're intelligent. Maybe I do want to talk to you. And so how I choose to navigate the conversation is informed by the response I get to the, the type of response I get to the loaded question. The loaded question gives me information about the state, uh, mental state and mental caliber of the person I'm talking to. Innuendo and loaded questions are very useful. And having information about the mental state and general intelligence of the person I'm talking to, that's useful whether you're nefarious or benevolent. Bad people do, should do that. Good people should do it too. That's... Innuendo and loaded questions exist on the competent half of the graph paper not on, not on the incompetent side and so welcome to the competent side whether innuendo and loaded questions are used for good and evil is a logically subsequent question prior to how we deploy the tools should I use this knife to kill people or to make cake? The use case is logically subsequent to understanding the tool itself. And, and so we've got through the uh, fallacy section, which was really within the realm of rhetoric. And it started off as bad things to avoid, but really turned into rhetorical power tools stuff that can be bad but if you're trying to be diplomatic and witty then you need those tools too we'll end with one more video on sarcasm it's sort of related to what we're talking about here and it's important when talking to some westerners and it's not intuitive and we're really bad at explaining it so i'm going to try to explain it but that's for next time okay so we know that uh, innuendo and loaded questions are in our rhetorical toolbox are they really all that good though uh, well okay we've got the the negative side that sometimes you don't want to make a direct condemnation or accusation and so you go the indirect method of innuendo but what about on the complimentary side because we had uh 
slippery slopes. We, we had an example of a slippery slope that was actually a encouragement. Keep doing A and eventually B will happen. Keep practicing and eventually you'll be an expert. We had a happy example of a slippery slope. Let's see if we can do the same thing for innuendos and loaded questions. Okay, so our straightforward criticism. You're a drunk. The negative one. Now the negative innuendo. I'm not saying that you're a drunk, but I did notice that you placed all the bottles in your liquor cabinet. Okay, that's one pair. And it's, it's in the frowny face category. Let's see if we can have a smiley face pair to go with it. Let's think of a straightforward compliment. You're a great student. Now, can we have an innuendo form compliment? Saying someone's a great student without saying it. I'm not saying that you're a perfect student, but I didn't notice that you got A's on all the tests. That would be a nice thing to hear. And it's... Structure is homologous to that uh, almost accusatory innuendo. Now let's uh, compare the two positive ones. You're a good student. And I'm not saying that you're a perfect student, but I, I did notice that you got A's on all the tests. Uh, I I'd like to hear the innuendo version a lot more than I'd like to, someone to say the straightforward version to me. Like the innuendo one, it backs up what it doesn't claim with data. A's on every test. And it also has modesty of the conclusion. The speaker's pointing out the limits of their of their precision, saying that, hey, I'm not saying you're a perfect student, but... So they've really thought about how far they want to go in their compliment, and they've produced data to support that compliment conclusion, your test grades. The person who says it the innuendo way, they, they've definitely thought about it. You're not perfect, but you did get A's on every test. That compliment definitely means something, whereas you're a great student. Uh, is the person just trying to get me to get out of their office and go away happy? Do they really mean it? Do they say that to every student? Are they implying that I'm not a great student? Like, the straightforward version, it doesn't sound so, so awesome. It's still good, but... It's not as good as the innuendo version. The innuendo version is literally a better compliment than the straightforward version. So if you want to give good compliments and be successful instead of blah at being friendly, you might want to use uh, innuendos and phrase your compliments in an innuendo fashion. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's see if we can do that for uh, loaded questions, too. Uh, our frowny face loaded question was the wife-beating one. A straightforward criticism, you are, or at least were, a wife-beater. The loaded question version, so have you stopped beating your wife yet? Yes, I stopped, but I probably used to beat her. Or no possibly because I still beat her, instead of because I never did. Okay, so that's the loaded question, frowny face one. Let's try to have a smiley face loaded question. First, let's think of a straightforward compliment, and then see if we can turn it into a loaded question. Straightforward compliment. You are a good writer. 
Okay, it's a compliment. Uh, now, how do we turn it? What would be a loaded question version of, you are a good writer? Maybe, so have you stopped writing that awesome essay yet? Same, same form as, so have you stopped beating your wife yet? But we just replaced beating your wife with writing that awesome essay. Now let's look at the possible answers. Yes. The, es the awesome essay is finished. That's good. Or, no. My awesomeness never stops. That would also be good. So either way, whether you go with a yes or a no answer, either yes, I finished the essay, hey, I'm good, in a good situation, or no, my awesomeness never stops, I am an, I am an excellent person in general, either way, we get to a very smiley face conclusion. And there's more variety in intricacy and fun in that than in the straightforward you are a good writer straightforward compliment so if you want a good good compliments and good encouragement innuendo loaded questions and slippery slopes keep practicing and you'll be an expert someday can be useful techniques for giving Compliments that are effective in being heartwarming and are in, and don't sound like just blah platitudes. So whether you're a diplomat trying to feel out the edges of how far you can push in a sensitive issue, like with the, I'm not saying you're a drunk, but you did replace all the liquor bottles. Or whether you're not... Not a diplomat trying to figure out how far you can ask certain topics, but you're just a friendly guy trying to give good compliments. In either case, or if you're a mean person trying to tear people apart, in any of those situations, you'll do a better job of it, whatever job you're doing, being a diplomat in a sensitive situation, being a mean person, or being a nice person giving compliments. Whatever you're trying to do, you'll probably do it more effectively if you have a command of slippery slopes, innuendo, and loaded questions. Yeah, rhetoric is intricate. That's why it goes at the end. But... Well, we'll get there. It, it doesn't... If it was something that you would learn immediately and it sinks in immediately, then it's then it would be obvious. You you could just read it in an article one day and get it. It wouldn't be something that if it was easy, it wouldn't be something that you need a teacher or a whole university for. So if you think it's hard, that probably means you're doing a good job being on the path to understanding. Thinking it's hard might be a good sign. Yeah, even I think rhetoric's hard. It's okay. Well, see you again next time for sarcasm.